Today, the Senate Banking Committee looked at predatory mortgage lending practices by financial institutions. Among the witnesses, Iowa Attorney General Thomas Miller, consumer advocates, and officials from lending companies. I come to you today in two roles. The first is in my role as CEO of Self Help which is a $800 million community development financial institution. That makes us the largest nonprofit community development lending organization in the nation, which is also about the size of one large bank branch, to put it in perspective. Self-help has been making subprime mortgage loans for 17 years. We're probably one of the oldest still remaining subprime mortgage lenders. We have provided $1.6 billion of financing to 23,000 families across the country. We charge about a half of 1% higher rate than a conventional rate mortgage. We've had virtually no defaults whatsoever in 17 years. If you have 23% default, I can almost assure you it is the result of lending with fraud in that process. Subprime lending can be done right. We agree that there are good subprime lenders. We hope that we are one. I come to you secondly as a spokesperson for an organization that started in North Carolina called the Coalition for Responsible Lending. The coalition that formed in North Carolina was a really remarkable event for anyone who watches politics among financial institutions. This coalition started in early 1999 and started with 120 CEOs of financial institutions who came together to ask for a law to be passed in order that they could squeeze the bad apples out of the lending industry in North Carolina. Let me tell you how I came to this work. For 17 years, I worked and was a preacher, preaching that we needed to get access to credit, particularly for African-American homeowners. Access to credit was my watchword. In the last two years, it has turned totally on its head, and I no longer worry about whether there's access to credit. It's now the terms of credit. And where there were sometimes lenders who were starving communities from getting credit they needed, the problem now is that many lenders are actually eating those communities. They're eating the equity of these families. The problem with the North Carolina law, and the reason that it's had such a chilling effect on subprime lending already in North Carolina is, that it doesn't give anybody safe harbor. If you're going to say people can't flip, that's fine, I'm all for it. But let's define what flipping is in a very clear way. Because if we don't define what it is, the legal risk that comes from being potentially sued for having flipped puts a chilling effect on lending. So sure, let, let's go after flipping, but let's not go after it in a vague way, which is what the North Carolina law does. And that's why I think it's had such a negative effect. Well. Uh, Mr. Eeks, uh, Professor Kalamiris sort of, to some extent, took out after North Carolina. And yeah, I think he prepared. sort of called he me out to the duel, right? So, statement. so you're, you're entitled to some response to it if um, you choose to make it. Yeah. Let, me, yeah, let me respond and maybe I'll ask a question. Uh, the data that is cited is from a study paid for by industry that looked at nine lenders. Nine lenders. That's the study. What it shows is that there has been a drop in lending, which I haven't seen before today, that says that North Carolina dropped in the third quarter of 99, fourth quarter, and the first two quarters of 2000. That was the data that I saw in that study. I really wish that that data were correct. I really do, because it would show that the goal we had in North Carolina, Mr. Calamiris may or may not know this, <coughs> But of the four practices that I mentioned, only one of them had gone into effect as of the third quarter of 1999. And the other one was flip, and that's the flipping, okay? So that had to be what would show a reduction in originations by 25% and 50%. I wish that number were right because when we passed the bill, the goal of the North Carolina legislation was to reduce flipping. And the way you reduce flipping is have less loans originated. So that data would show that gap. Here's what I would like to ask, is whether Mr. Calamiris knows of any other events that were active in North Carolina during the third quarter of 1999. 
Are you aware of any other environmental changes? Was there a hurricane or something? We had in North Carolina on September 15th, 1999, the largest flood in the history of North Carolina ever recorded. It took 15,000 units directly down the river. It had as many as 100,000 families who were dislocated. September 15th, 1999. They couldn't have borrowed money if, if, they, if the predatory lenders had come to them in a boat. Uh, so I have a question. His, his assessment, I wish it were right. I wish that we really had seen a, quote, chilling effect because the only provision we had in effect was the anti-flipping. That's what we wanted to do, was to reduce the number of flips. I'm going to draw this to a close, not because we've exhausted all the... May, may, may I just make one comment, oh, Mr. Yes, Chairman? Certainly. I, because I didn't get a chance to respond. No, I don't, the, I don't want the flood, I don't, but it'll be very I don't, brief. I don't want you to go it's away a fact, feeling Mr. Chairman. that we, we try to be uh, eminently fair here, yes. But no, I, I mean respond on one fact. Yeah. The, the evidence that I presented in the appendix showed that the decline in subprime lending occurred only in some income classes. So it, it, it seems a little strange to say it was the result of a flood because then you'd have to believe that the flood only affected people but the subprime lending 000. occurs primarily in certain income classes, does it not? No, the, the point, Mr. Chairman, is that I have it for the different income classes, some, only subprime lending. So I'm controlling, I'm not looking at all lending, just subprime. And the point is it only affected people who are really subject to these particular rules. And I did note that was phased in over 2000, and the data are about 2000, not about the end of 99. So I just want to emphasize that. Thank we don't have all the facts here before us. I don't claim that we do. You, you just want to you want to get out from under the flood. I take it. Is that <laughs> exactly? Is that it? That's not that. As they say, that that dog's not going to hunt. <laughs> if I if I could just and I promise I'll be quick. Yeah, I have to. I have to draw. The poor people, where they own homes, yeah. happens to often be often be in low lying land that ends up being floodplain. Yeah. Rich people don't live in in flood areas, yeah. and so it's extremely. Uh, reasonable that you would have families in the lower income brackets who were homeowners who were subject to these loans. I mean, I think, I really wish I could bring your, at, what, at Columbia, I'd love to bring him just for a few days to actually see how the marketplace works, both in floods and out of floods, because yeah. he does not get it right now. The problem in North Carolina that we found was unbelievable. We found that between 10 and 20,000 families in North Carolina were losing the equity in their homes or losing their homes outright every single year. For me personally, this was really an affront. I had spent 18 years at that point helping families own homes. And what I found was one or two lenders, I don't have to look at the average for the industry, but one or two lenders who were undoing in a month's time every possible step of good that self-help had done with its 23,000 loans over 18 years. I have since traveled around the country and I have said that I will spend every penny that self-help owns, I'll spend every penny that I own until we stop this practice of basically stealing people's homes in the guise of lending. And again, I want to thank you for very helpful testimony and from some, the obvious careful thought that went into the uh, uh, statements. And the uh, committee will now uh, stand adjourned.